God is good. Amen. So I'm a little I'm a little overwhelmed right now just from everything. So it's just such a beautiful beautiful day. So I'm going to take a drink of water. Okay. Oh, man. So if this is your first time visiting, uh, we started a series last week, and this series is a lot of fun. We do this series every year uh, where we talk specifically about the Holy Ghost, uh, his role in our life, the Spirit of God with us right now uh, that quickens our mortal bodies, that raises us to new life when we get saved, but he also gives us gifts. And so last week we talked about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So I highly encourage you, uh, if this is your first time here or you missed last week, go check out last week because like all the series I do, it's pretty foundational as far as we build as we go. So there's some things that I definitely want you to check out in that. It's on our YouTube channel. Go check it out. Also, the ghost chat coming up is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Jerry, it was such a powerful story and testimony behind that bumper video. Uh, so I definitely want you guys to catch that. It'll be released on Wednesday. So uh, check that out. But um, today, what's amazing about this is the Holy Spirit... Um, I love it. Uh, Luke, Dr. Luke always says, uh, he calls him Jehovah Sneaky, uh, <laughs> which, which I always love. But he sets us up. And see, here's the thing. When I say that, you might have a specific memory of somebody setting you up in a really bad way. You know, nobody likes to be set up, right, and, and set up to fail, right? And unfortunately, I think many of us have probably experienced that in the world, right? But the Holy Spirit doesn't set us up to fail. He sets us up for close relationship with Jesus, he sets us up for kingdom success. So it's what I like to call a divine conspiracy. So what's really funny here is because we're specifically going to be talking about the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit is poured out. We're going to be talking about tongues, which is always controversial, right, in the body of Christ. Everybody has different stances on it. But what's cool is this whole event, this day of Pentecost, it was a divine setup. It was planned a long time ago. Right? And the Holy Spirit set us up. He set the church up for success. It's where the church was born in fire and in power. I hope you understand that, it's that this right here, this building is not the church. We are the church. And what's great is that the Bible calls us living stones. We gather together like we are now. We all get together. We create this temple that the Spirit resides in. Right, that God meets us in power. So what I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit is ready to raise you to life. See, we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. We talk about miracles. I've experienced miracles. Anybody in the room, you've experienced miracles? Amen. Praise God. That's amazing, right? I, I've been cured of an incurable disease. Like, I mean, I have documented evidence of a miracle in my life. But I want you to understand the greatest miracle is and will always be the dead coming to life, which you just saw. Today, people giving their life to Jesus, encountering the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit and becoming alive in Christ. I want you to get that. Before you were following Christ, or maybe you're not following Christ today, and I want you to know, it's not that you were just in a bad way, you were dead. It's not that just you're in a bad way now if you're not following Jesus, you're dead. <laughs> Right? This is what happens when we give our lives to Christ, when we surrender to Jesus, which some of you in here, maybe you're feeling that draw today. You can't explain it. It's just like the Holy Spirit is pulling on your heart. You're like, oh, you got that feeling in your stomach. like, oh, I don't know. You're kind of torn right now between do I stay or do I run? <laughs> like, what, what do I need? Right? I'm going to encourage you to stay because what's happening is the Holy Spirit is just drawing you. He's saying, hey, it's your time to come alive. Right? So, again, a divine setup, which is what we're talking about today. So episode two of all of this is tongues, timing, and other ghost things. And of course, by ghost stories, I hope you guys have been able to read between the lines, we're talking about the Holy Ghost, right? I just want to make that clear because I think there was some confusion online the other week and uh, yeah, all sorts of amazing things have been said about it. So uh, this is about the Holy Ghost, guys, okay? I'm not like a big advocate of, uh, you know, just celebrating random spirits, okay? That's just weird. Uh, so we're talking about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, uh, newsflash, the Holy Spirit <laughs> knows what he's doing. Do you believe that? Okay, good. See, it's easy to say it, but when we're in a situation that requires us to take a step of faith, we often question, does he know what he's doing? Right? And see, that's the beauty of it, though. See, God wants you in that position because it takes faith to please God. To say, I trust you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to take this step. Right? How many of you remember that when you've taken a step with the Lord and it was scary? <laughs> I always like to think back to uh, Indiana Jones. I think it was, uh, I forget, I think it's the last one. That, that, well, not the last, they got new. The original three. He steps out, right, and he was, had to take the step, the leap of faith. And remember, he said, he said and he, 
<laughs> it's that, that's what I'm always reminded of every time I step out with the Lord. It's like, man, I got to take this big step, and it looks like it's a long way down, but yet he just catches me right on time, and he shows me something powerful and amazing. So he knows what he's doing, and so much of this life is trusting the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of all of what it's about, trusting the Holy Spirit. In fact, here's the thing. I love, how many of you, you're a big fan of the Bible? You like the Bible. Good. Good. You're my people. That's great. Right? We love the book, right? We, we love the Bible, the Word of God. But understand, this wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for people following the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God. It's God breathed. But yet the Holy Spirit partnered with men, with people, and led them to write these things. Right? And it, but it is God breathed. It's, it's the Word of God. And Jesus is the living word, right? So all of this is so important that we trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. See, I have a lot of personal experience in my life with his timing, right? Like I've been set up many times by the Holy Spirit or Jehovah Sneaky as Luke likes to say. I, I, I've been set up many times by the Holy Spirit for my good, but I didn't even know what was going on. In fact, there, when I look back, even what we're sitting in today, what we're doing today, we're talking 10, 15, 20 years ago, God was working for this moment right now. Because you need to understand that he doesn't look at time like you look at time. He's got all the time in the world. He's outside of time. So he makes plans, and there are markers in your life. Those of you who have been following the Lord for a while, you know what I'm talking about. You remember looking back, and you're like, that's a marker. That's a marker. I want to be honest with you all. For me, I've been on this personal journey, and the marker that I know the Holy Spirit's been setting me up for just happened the other day. It's called We Got Signs on This Building. Like, finally. <laughs> right? And, 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 and it's just amazing to me. But even in that, the Holy Spirit began to speak, and he said, I don't want just signs on the building. I want signs in the building. Right? Right? I want to be moving in power. So people aren't just saying, hey, that's a cool sign. They're saying, no, that's where God moves. Things are happening there. Why? Because we're surrendered to what the Spirit of God wants to do. Right? And, and it's cool because it doesn't mean you have to be weird, okay? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's like, oh, maybe I'm in. Okay, <laughs> that sounds great. Right? You don't got to be weird about it, right? Luke says it all the time. You can be normal and anointed. Praise God. But see, I had this experience with his timing, and I've, I've kind of learned something over the years, and I've just noticed a trend. Like, a lot of times before, God's about to do something big in my life, and I feel like a promotion, if you will, or something like I'm stepping into a kind of a new season or whatever you want to call it, I always experience false accusation. Somebody accuses me of something that's not true. Now, see, we know when we accuse people of things, right, we're aligning with who's known as the accuser, the enemy, right? And when, you know what? I just experienced that last week. And, and see, I'm not upset. I'm excited, <laughs> Right? Why? Because God is doing something new. Something is opening, and I'm getting to step into something that he's already set up. So I want you to get this, because none of this is by accident. It's by following the lead. Now, sometimes he says he's our, a light unto our, our, our path, right? Or a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, right? Sometimes, it, actually a lot of times for me, he is that, that lamp right at my feet. So I'm just trusting, just stepping, just stepping. But, and occasionally, he's that light to the path, where I can see a good long way. But see, what I'm trying to tell you is with the Holy Spirit, you're not wandering aimlessly. You're not nervous when everybody else is nervous. You're not panicked. We're looking at our world today. Everybody's like, World War III is about to be upon us. Do you, let me, can I tell you something? Holy Spirit's not nervous. He's not worried. Now, does that mean we don't have a job to do? No, we do. <laughs> We do, right? But, but we got to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit. We see all throughout Scripture there is full divine setups everywhere. He sets us up for a kingdom of success, but we must be prepared to recognize it and partner with him in what he is doing. As I told you, the people that wrote the Bible, right, they partnered with the leading of the Spirit of God. Could you imagine had they been like, well, Holy Spirit, since you want to write this thing, just go ahead and write it. And they just kind of, and they didn't do anything. What would we have? Right? It, it requires us to partner with what the Holy Spirit wants to do, right? He doesn't force us. He wants to partner with us. He doesn't, he doesn't just invade, like come in and say, I'm living in your life now. What do you have to do? You have to invite him. You have to surrender. He's not just kicking down the door and be like, I'm taking over. You know who likes to do that, though? The devil. <laughs> he just wants a foothold. Instead, it says the Lord, Jesus, comes and he knocks on the door of our heart, and he says, those that would open the door and welcome him in, he says he will come in and meet with them, right? He's a gentleman. 
He wants you to partner with him. So Acts 1, 6 through 8, I was actually reading this uh, like last night, and so I decided to just drop it in here because, you know, the series is like that. It's just like, you know, whatever you want to do, Holy Spirit. So Acts 1, 6, it says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord. So this is, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead. So if there was any doubt from any of his followers at this point if he's the Messiah or not, those are gone. Why? Because he's standing right in front of them after they witnessed him being killed on a cross. He's resurrected. So there's no argument to be had about this. They said, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of, to Israel at this time? They're like, okay, it's all done. You're the Messiah. Put down Rome, baby. <laughs> We're like, here we are. You're here to put your physical kingdom here on earth, right? And, and so let's, let's, let's keep reading. It says, he said to them, it is not for you to know times. Oh, my gosh. How many of you in here, you'd be really, you say, that bothers me. It's not for you to know the plan. Uh but I need to know, right? My wife, she loves a good plan, right? Right, babe? I love, she's up here. Look at her. She's, look at, she's so beautiful. She's like, please stop looking. So precious. We've got a whole great group of people up here. So, so, right, but she loves to plan. She likes to plan to plan, my wife, right? Whereas I just like to go, baby. Let's go for it, right? So we're a great combo, right? But he says, you don't get to really know the times, so don't worry about that. He says that the Father has set by his own authority, right? But what does he do say? The very next verse, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So while he's saying here, I'm not giving you a literal date because he didn't, he didn't correct him. We understand Jesus is going to return and set up his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, right? So he didn't stop and say, no, you're wrong. He said, That's not, you don't need to worry about the time. He said, what you need to be concerned with is I'm about to give you the spirit of God that is going to empower you to be my witnesses and to start taking over now. And we've seen this throughout the uh, the history of church, how it spread coming out of Rome. It took over Rome. It spread all over the world. We play a very small piece in a story that's being written and has been written for thousands of years. And what a privilege it is. He has the best timing. We see it on full display throughout all of Scripture. He does things in order, even if to us it may seem out of order. Has God ever told you to do something? He's like, well, I don't know, God. It seems weird. <laughs> it seems out of order, right? right? But, but it might seem out of order to us, but guess what? You don't have the big overall picture view. He does. He has the eternal view always. So Pentecost. Let's talk about this. Pentecost. Some of you are freaking out already because I said Pentecost. We're Pentecostal. Okay, Pentecost, it's a big, scary word. You know what it means? It means 50. <laughs> okay, cool. We're good? <laughs> okay, 50 days after Passover is where we get the word, and so where we get Pentecost is where we get the word Pentecostal. And we read what took place on the first Pentecost since Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. So what we're about to read is the first uh, Pentecost feast, right, that they have. Because remember, the Jewish calendar is marked by feast. Remember when I said Markers. Feasts that were already planned, right? So you see the Holy Spirit working in the structure he's already laid out, right? So he's saying on Pentecost, this takes place in the first Pentecost after Jesus has ascended. It's the first time we see that the Spirit came on people and stayed on multiple people at the same time. You don't see this in all of Scripture. Not like this. This is new. This is different. Everyone is empowered by the Holy Spirit and it stays on them. Just like the Messiah, the, the sign that he said you would know he's the Messiah, why the Spirit will come on him and stay on him, which we hadn't seen up to that point in, in the Bible. If you've read the Bible at all, you know you recognize this, right? The Spirit would come onto people, empower them for a moment, for an action, right? But then they would, it would leave. This is it stays. This is powerful. So this is the first time the Spirit came on people and stayed on them all at once. It was a divine setup. Many nations represented, were the, they were all there for the Feast of Weeks. They were traveling to Jerusalem for this specific time. Do you think that this was an accident that the day of Pentecost the Spirit chose that day? No. You had nations from everywhere were gathered from all over coming for this feast. And this feast traditionally in the Hebrew culture was to remember, it was to celebrate the giving of the Torah, the giving of the law. And when you read when that happened, what happened was God showed up, it was, it's called a theophany. He showed up in a tangible way and that tangible way was fire from Mount Sinai. He showed up as fire. Here we are again on the day of Pentecost. He shows up as fire. All right, so it's all connected. It's a divine set up. Other language. So they begin to speak in other tongues, other real languages. And what was it to do? It was to draw everyone that was there for that time to Christ. 
Every language was represented there. That they began to speak, and it drew them all to Christ. Remember, I want you to understand this about the Holy Spirit. Some of you, maybe you're like me, and uh, you grew up in full-scale charismania, right? Like, look what the Lord has done. You're not going to, sister, so and so's jumping in the pews. She lost her shoes, right? She's clotheslining somebody. There's flags. There's tambourines. There's all sorts of stuff, right? It's a wild good time, so you better not fall asleep because you might end up on the ground, right? And, and so you might be thinking about that, and I want you to understand something, though. The Holy Spirit does so much more than give you the gooseies. And make you excited. Make you, make, you, make you speak in tongues. He does so much more than that. And his main job, you ready? His main job, he convicts us of sin. He leads us in all truth. But his main job is to reveal Jesus. His job in you is to make you look more like Jesus. So the closer you walk with Holy Spirit, the more you become like Jesus. Now, I didn't say you are Jesus, so everybody settle down. <laughs> the more you become like him. And this is a process, amen? Acts 2, 1 through 30. Let's just read about it really quickly. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Some translations say one accord. This is important. They were united. What were they united around? What Jesus had said. Wait until you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do not leave. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Now, scholars recognize that, hey, there's a lot of illustration being used here in the language, right? That's why you're reading a lot of like a, like a, like, because they're just trying to describe as best they can what they experienced, right? So it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in different tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crown came together and was confused because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. See, I pray, I pray that God would move in such a way here in Pasadena, Texas, here at Risen Nation, that a crowd would come out and say, what is going on? Something is happening. Something is happening in our schools. Something is happening in our workplaces. God is showing up in places outside of the church building. People are being saved, healed, delivered, redeemed, restored. Families are being put back together. Marriages are being saved. That we're on the brink of failure and disaster. What is going on? And then that's where we get to say it's Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit moving because each of those because each of them heard them speaking their own language can i tell you the holy spirit still moves like this he speaks your language He's, even as i'm talking to you right now you might not i'm and i know i talk fast some of you are like pastor were you talking in tongues what well, i couldn't follow right and i'll read you the whole bible in like 20 minutes so so don't play right now but like even in that there's somebody else speaking and it's the holy spirit and he's speaking in a way that's cutting you right to the quick. But as I'm talking, he's saying, hey, remember that relationship I told you to walk away from? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> remember that thing I told you to delete off your phone? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> right? He, he's speaking right where you're at. This is how he works. Let's keep reading. It says, crowd together. They were speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? I love this because I wonder, is there a look about me? Like, if you look at me, you can tell I grew up in Deer Park. <laughs> Howdy. Yeah, he's from, yeah. Look at him. I tell you all about Petro Kim. Deer Park, baby. Right? Yeah, no, I wonder. I wonder because that's what they're like. Look at them. Galileans. Look at them. <laughs> like, they're, they're like, we know they didn't learn this. <laughs> right? They aren't that smart. <laughs> and, and so we look at this. Aren't they all speaking Galileans? How is it? They say this. They say, How is it that we can each hear them in our own native language? Uh, Parthians, uh, Medes, uh, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phygeria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts. Cretans! Guys, I, I, can I be real with you? I feel like maybe I belong to the Cretans. I don't know. I, I just always love that name of group of people. I'm, I've, well, my dad called me that all the time. Growing up, he called me a Cretan. I feel like that's probably what he meant, right? <laughs> Cretans and Arabs, we hear them what? They're declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. It says they were all astounded and perplexed. You ever been in a place with God, you've seen him move in such a way you're perplexed? You're like, what, what is that? Some of you are like, Pastor, what's perplexed? Well, you're just, you're really confused at the moment, but you're, you're, you're more so, you're, you're intrigued. You want to know more. You want to, you want to dig deeper. It says saying to one another, what does this mean? 
I can't help it. Y'all know me. Every time I, I say, what does that mean? I hear that. I go back to the viral clip of the double rainbow. It's a double rainbow. What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> right? <laughs> but what if? What if our whole city was gripped by a moving of the Holy Spirit where they literally had to stop. They had to dig. They had to reason and say, what does it mean? I have to figure it out. This is, the kind of, this is the kind of Christianity that we need to see in our society that drives people deeper, that says, look, I got to know because I know their life. I know what they used to be like, and I see them now, and something is different. God moved. There's without a doubt God moved, and I need to find out why. I need to find out how I want to be part of it. A Christianity that brings people in, it doesn't push them out. It draws them in. And then, of course, it says, what does it mean? And then, but some, of course. You ever notice there's always but some. But some sneered and said they're drunk on new wine. Ah, they're just drunk. What's funny, though, is how accurate they actually were. They're drunk on the new wine of the Holy Spirit. Now, hear me. I want to be very clear here because I don't want you to be like, that's right, Pastor. Let's get drunk on the new wine. Don't be a weirdo. That's not what I'm talking about. But I mean, specifically, that's what prophetically speaking is the new wine that is poured out. And it says that we have the new wine skid now to receive the new wine. What was it? It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we could be transformed and changed and move as a people united as one in power. This is what is happening here. This is amazing. Revival. Revival. I've heard this my whole life. How many of you have ever heard of revival? Woo! Yeah, some of you, I know, I know yeah, woo! <laughs> revival, that means we get together and scream and get real crazy. Yeah, hey, praise God. Revival is happening Monday to Wednesday. We're meeting every 7 p.m., right? Revival, I've heard it growing up my whole life, and I want you to understand something about revival. Revival is simply returning to what should be the biblical norm. That's revival. To actually read the Bible and believe it. <laughs> to go, oh, it says it? Okay. <laughs> And then watch God move. And people be like, it's revival. He's like, no, we just started believing this. We started believing that we could lay our hands on the sick and see them recover. We started believing that we could speak with other tongues. We started believing that we could prophesy. We started believing that we could declare the heart of God and would call people up out of the pit and set them up on the rock with Jesus. That's what happened. We started believing what this said. Some of you are like, dude, you are nuts. Yes, crazy. (laughs) Why? I believe it. Listen, I don't know what this means, but God speaks to me every day. Does that make me crazy? Maybe. It's just the reality. He's talking. Are we listening? Are we listening? It's this, see, Pentecost, I'm convinced of this. Why it's so controversial is because it's a foundational event for the church. This is how the church was born, y'all. Born in power. And yes, of course, the enemy wants to divide us all over the place over this subject. Why? He doesn't want us walking united in the power that's available to us. Why? Because we destroy the kingdom of darkness and we build the kingdom of light. That's why he wants to stop. So this is like a reverse Tower of Babel. How many of you learned about the Tower of Babel before? Right, it's, it's it, it, the men, right? The children of men were all building this tower. They were going, we're going to build a tower in the heavens. It's classic. It still exists today. It's people wanting the kingdom without having to submit to the rule of the king. <laughs> We want the things that the kingdom have, but we don't want anything to do with this king that still exists today, right? So theirs is being built, and, and, and God recognizes, look what they can do when they're united. Crazy. Let's go confuse their languages. This will be fun, right? Everybody, I always want a picture, like, what must that have been like? We're sitting here talking, and all of a sudden, I'm talking Italian, and you're like, what? <laughs> hey, right? Like, what, did that happen immediately? I don't know, right? So, I, but like, we're sitting here talking, like, what's going on, right? And confuse all the work. But then we see on the day of Pentecost, he reverses this, and he says, I will give my church, my people, no matter what nation they come from or what their native tongue is, I will give them one language in the spirit so they can be united and they can do great things in me. Right? So it's a reverse tower of Babel. The one we see, we see about this power, this word in the Greek is dunamis. It's like dynamite. There's power. You know, one of the things in the Greek that I love, one of the best translations I love this from the Greek about this dunamis power is it says it's the power, and you know, and this is the thing that I felt like got skipped up a lot when I was growing up. It was more about the feeling, but it was the power for moral excellence. <laughs> The power for more, what does that mean? The power to choose the right thing. The power to say no to the wrong thing. The power to say no to sin. 
That's what, the, that's what the Holy Spirit brings to your life. Say, well, Pastor, I can pray in tongues real fast. Cool. Can you stop looking at porn? <laughs> oh, man, anytime you drop that word, people just... <laughs> Does he know? Oh, the Holy Spirit does, though. That's in the we'll keep moving. <laughs> I don't know. The Holy Spirit empowers us to reach the lost. He sets us up. He appoints for us to intervene with his hope in other people's lives. Listen, I am not a busybody. I always tell people, save the drama for your mama. <laughs> I, I don't want drama, right? I'm big on like, and you guys know, they've been in this for a while. You know, if you got beef with somebody and you bring it up to me, we're scheduling appointments, we're sitting down, and we're discussing it, right? Like we're, we're trying to work things out, right? And I've had people kind of squirm and try to get out of it, but we find them eventually, and we sit down and we work through it, right? Because why? I don't have time for the drama. We got important things going on, and we can't be divided, right? And so, so here's the thing, though, is, is I'm not a busybody, but the Holy Spirit is, He wants to be involved in your life. In fact, he is. He knows what you need. And so when you go to the store, what what, what a a world it would be if believers, when they walked into the gas station, when they walked into places that they thought was just another step of their day, the Holy Spirit actually said, no, that's a divine appointment, and there's going to be, Jeff is going to be hanging out there, and I want you to tell Jeff that it's okay, that I love him, even though his father left him when he was a little kid. I never rejected him. Tell Jeff that, and tell him that I'm calling him home. Tell him, right? And what, what happens? You bring the hope of the Holy Spirit into somebody else's life. This is how he works through us. I don't know about Jeff, but that just definitely was a random name. So Jeff, just know, if your dad left you when you were little, God loves you. The Holy Spirit is God's empowering and personal presence that now dwells in us. He moves us to the mission of Christ together. He fills us, seals us, commissions us, sends us, speaks to us, uses us, empowers us, and gifts us. These are grace gifts. You don't earn these. You ask and you receive and you walk it out. You grow in these. It's God's presence, I want you to get this, that identifies us from everybody else. It should, something should be different if you're carrying the presence of the living God in your life. What's different? So a lot of people make this big deal. You know, this is, I know deliverance has gotten really big lately and we've got people talk about it all the time, which is, it's important, I think it's necessary. There are still demons in the world and people need deliverance, that's true. But you know one thing I've noticed, even since I was young in the Lord, I remember when I encountered somebody really dealing with something dark, I didn't notice anything. What I noticed was their reaction to what was in me. It was this, whether it was refusing to touch me or whether it was all of a sudden wanting to get really close, right? It wasn't me. It was the spirit that is in me. To walk, to really be marked by the presence of God. Moses literally said it. You read about Moses when God says, all right, you know what? You can have the promised land. Take these stiff-necked people. I'm done with them. Go. Get out of here. Right? You go. go. You can have all the stuff. You can have all the promised land, all the fun stuff. Just go take it. It's fine. I'm not going. God literally said that. Check it out. He says, I'm not going. And Moses said, no way. No way. I'm not going anything, anywhere without your presence. Why? Because that's who we are as a people. We are marked by your presence. Your presence goes with us everywhere. And I'm not taking a step towards that promised land because without you in it, it's not the promised land. Right? It's, it's just more land. You are the promise. So there's three types of tongues. Let's talk about tongues for a minute. Everybody loves this, right? Everybody loves speaking in tongues. Everybody a big fan? No? No? Okay. Yeah, we got some Baptists in here. You're like, oh, God, where am I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Three types of tongues we read about in Scripture. Tongues for public. This is outreach. This is what we witness on the day of Pentecost. Right? They're speaking known languages that are represented at the time. What? To reveal Jesus to them. Two, tongues for church edification with interpretation. Now, if you grew up in a charismatic church, you probably experienced this, especially in the 90s. Right? The worship would would go down quiet, and then all of a sudden somebody would start speaking loudly in tongues, and then someone else would interpret what was said. And I want to make this clear. This is simply God just speaking to the church to edify them. Right? The Bible talks about this. It says, hey, this is something. But I want you to understand it's prophecy. Essentially, it's the same thing as prophecy. Right now, I made this remark a couple years ago, and I said, we don't experience that a lot here at Resonation because we allow prophecy to flow freely. So I feel like that's how God is speaking in a movie. We don't, that's, he doesn't use us in that way, typically. And then wouldn't you know it, during the altar time, that service, somebody gave a message in tongues, and I had to interpret it. So <laughs> there you go. Holy Spirit was like, hey, yeah, tell me what to do, right? 
I do what I want. So, but this is for church edification. How do we know? Because it's been interpreted. So you can understand what was said, and it is to edify the body. And number three, tongues for personal edification. This is what I like to call the grace of tongues or the power of a personal experience or a prayer language. Acts 10, 44 through 47 says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, even on them dirty Gentiles. Yeah, you bet. They got the Holy Spirit, praise God. Somebody should say amen because I know we don't, we got a bunch of Gentiles in here. I can tell you that for a fact, right? We, we, this is man, redemption, hope. And he said he poured out the same way. How did he know? Because they began to speak in other tongues, declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, can anyone withhold water or baptism to prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Now, tongues are a byproduct of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it's not the only byproduct. Okay. I want you to understand that because there are 22 stories in Acts about people coming to follow Jesus, and we only read about tongues in three. Okay? We only read about tongues in three. And I've literally, if you were here last week, you've heard all three of them already. Okay? So the, remember, I want you to understand something. Acts is a retelling of events of a narrative that happened. It doesn't mean it's the rule to follow. Let me give you an example. Paul was bit right after he was shipwrecked. He comes off that ship, and there's so much beautiful uh, theology behind even deep in that. Me and Steve were talking about it out front after the first service. I love Steve because he always likes to come up and, like, we have, like, a Bible powwow. It's always such a great time. And so we were talking a little bit deeper what God was doing there. But still, here's the fact. They were shipwrecked. He gets bit by poisonous snakes, right, venomous. As the natives are watching him, he shakes them off. They're watching for him to drop dead, and he does not, right? So we recognize the Holy Spirit intervened in that moment, right? You know what we don't do now, though, is we don't go, okay, so that's Holy Holy Spirit moved in. Everybody bring in the poisonous snakes. All right, guys, grab you a snake. The Holy Spirit's with you. You'll be good. Don't worry about, right? No, No, we don't do that. Why? Because this is a narrative of a specific situation where God moved in a certain way. It's a retelling. It's not a rule. This is why we use a lot of Paul's letters for guidance when it comes to gifts of the Spirit because he actually sets some rules for us to follow, to protect others, and to grow ourselves. So with that being said, there are three misunderstandings about speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Spirit. It's a misunderstanding number one. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not even saved. Ooh, that's a, no, that's not correct, <laughs> right? And now I'm telling you things that entire denominations believe, Maybe some of you sitting in here, I'm like really messing with you right now because you were like, wait, well, well hold on, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I, I'm just telling you what the, the Bible says. If, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not even saved. That's not true. Number three, here's another one, and the last one. Speaking in tongues is not for today. Also false. <laughs> it's for today. So, I, just right off the bat, if you consider me your pastor, if you like, Risen Nation is my home church, cool. I want you to know from my heart, I'm more concerned about how you speak in English than how you speak in tongues. Okay, <laughs> cool. All right, good. So if we're not, if we're not having our, 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 our language transformed, right, by this, then you probably got a hold of something else, okay? There should be fruit that follows from your life. So, so tongues, we see this mentioned, it's, the Greek word is literally where we get the word glossary. Uh, it's a language or dialect used by a particular people distinct from that of other nations. So I want to remind you, this church is called Risen Nation for a reason, because we're a risen nation, right? We belong to the kingdom of God. We often say this is the kingdom first church. People ask me, what denomination are you? I say, well, kingdom first. Where's that? I don't know what the, I was like, I kind of made it up, but it's in scripture. I guess it's good, right? <laughs> kingdom first church, right? We believe in the kingdom of God. If you're pushing the kingdom, if you're pushing Jesus, then I'm pushing you, right? Because we, we, we know it takes more than just this group of people right here. Right, to see our community transform. Uh, N.T. Wright, who's an incredible uh, New Testament theologian, he said this about tongues. He said, it's the gift of speech, which though making sounds and using apparent or even actual languages somehow bypasses the speaker's conscious mind. There was a cool uh, special. You can go find it. I'm going to send you all into maybe a deep dive on YouTube. There was like a 60-minute special uh, back in the day. I was real little when they made it, but I remember watching it. And um, they, were, they took a bunch of people that said they pray in tongues. And they're like, oh, really? That intrigues us. And, of course, the journalists were, like, looking at them like they were crazy. They're like, yeah, okay, you, you crazy people. <laughs> we're going to see what this is about. And so they're like, all right, cool. They put them in this thing to, to, give them, uh, to brain, have their brain scanned. And they told them, okay, pray in English. Pray normally. So they begin to pray, you know. And, man, I don't know where they found these people, but they could pray. Y'all, you know what I'm talking about when you pray with somebody that knows all of God's names? Like, it's incredible. And they pray, and you're like, Jesus, oh, my God, <laughs> what's happening? Uh, so they're praying, though, you know. And it showed as they scanned the frontal lobe where your speech is at, it, it was lighting up as they're praying English. And they said, okay, cool, now stop, now pray in uh, what you believe is tongues. 
They told them to pray. So they did. They scanned again. Dark. They were like, that's weird. <laughs> right? What, it bypasses your conscious mind. Why? It's not you praying. It's the Spirit praying through you. Amen? And it's good. No, it's great. Right, go check it out. For real, it's still on YouTube. You just might have to dig a little bit. Uh, so tongues are a form of prayer and praise you express to God in a language you don't understand. So in these letters, in 1 Corinthians, I want to read just a couple of verses. In this letter of 1 Corinthians, where we get a lot of the rules, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, we get a lot of our rules for the gifts of the Spirit, of where this is really pulled from. And so in this, Paul, it's a one-sided conversation. He's answering something. you got to re- remember that. He's responding to something, right? So this is where this letter is coming from. Uh, he's responding to this church that had gotten really zealous for manifestations, and they were literally basically setting up tears, like, oh, I speak in tongues and you don't, so you're less than me, right? You're not as spiritual as I am false, right? So Paul brings some correction to this. So number one, uh, verse 1, 14, 1 through 5, it says, let love, everybody say that, love. Love be your highest goal. Do you think that's important? Okay. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Hey, Samuel Institute meeting this Tuesday, if you want to learn more about that. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, it says, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. Really? It says, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysteries. I mean, I love a good mystery, but Paul is saying, hey, you know, when you're out of the people, you should probably speak in English. But it says, but one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues. Does it sound like Paul is against speaking in tongues? No. It says, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you're saying so that the whole church can be strengthened. Amen. So tongues, five quick points about tongues. Number one, they are to God, not to people. Number two, they don't make any sense. Number three, they edify the speaker but not the church. Some of you can relate to this because you like to sing in the shower and it edifies you. But if you sang in front of us, it would hurt us. It would scare us. Leave that alone, right? That's for your personal edification, right? Don't bring your singing voice in the car to us because uh, it's not edifying, right? We got some singers here that will edify you, right? Some people say, like Sage was singing today, right? You heard her singing. You were like, I can, I can see Jesus. This is amazing, right? So her singing, her gifting that God has given her edifies you. It edifies us as a group. But if you heard me sing that same song, you would run. You would say, oh, my gosh, devil, the devil has a hold at Risen Nation, right? That's, <laughs> run away, <laughs> right? Okay, so we understand it's, it's, it's to edify us, right, and less interpreted. Number four, not nearly as important as prophecy. Number five, ideally, everybody should speak in these languages. Edify, to construct or build something up with the purpose of improvement. Improvement for what? For the use of the kingdom. This is what it means to be edified. Hear me. Some of you have been edified before and you thought it was not edification because it was uncomfortable. Your ego was deflated and you thought this can't be the Lord. No, it was the Lord. Why? What was he doing? He was making you usable for the kingdom. So he had to do something with all that pride and arrogance. (laughs) Okay. All right. (laughs) Well, so don't confuse edification with exaltation. Okay? Edification is different. Now, most of the time, yes, it is. It's calling out the good. As we say, calling out the gold. Yes, 100%. But sometimes you need an attitude check. You know, in any situation, the one thing you can control, you know what it is? Your attitude. Oh. <laughs> right? So, so we talk about this edification, what it means. Holy Spirit, he produces humility. See, Paul goes on in this letter to make a claim that he's glad. He actually kind of flexes on him because I'm sure he was accused that he didn't speak in tongues at all. They're like, oh, Paul, can you not speak in tongues? Wow, crazy. (laughs) And he responds, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. (laughs) Wow. I think, wow, right? Amazing, Paul. A strange flex, but okay, right? (laughs) I speak in tongues more than any of you. But yet we look at the fruit in his life. Where is Paul's ministry? If I could define it with one word, it would be humility. You had somebody that said he was the Hebrew among Hebrews, Pharisee among Pharisees, and now he's serving and staying in prison, basically being abused. Why? And he says it's all good because it's for Jesus Christ. It's for the expansion of his church. He says, I consider all these other things garbage compared to the knowledge and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So if he really did pray in tongues more than anybody, we see it defined in his life by what? His humility. To continue to pray, to continue to grow and be edified to the point where you are getting very low. (laughs) 
You're defined by humility. You're humble. You're really humble. As Moses said, I am the most humble. <laughs> I always laugh about that one. It's like, oh, he wrote that. Okay, cool. <laughs> I've had many moments where the Holy Spirit has wrecked me and showed me my arrogance on full display. Some of you I know I can tell by the interactions I've had with you, you have yet to be taken behind the woodshed by the Holy Spirit, but don't worry, it's coming. <laughs> You always know, right? You always know that moment where the Holy Spirit's like, hey, come here. Okay. <laughs> time to grow up. Time to change. 1 Corinthians 14, 6 says, dear brothers and sisters, I, I, if I should come speaking to you in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy you're teaching, that will be helpful. So a couple things really carefully uh, or quickly here. On our prayer team, we have a great prayer ministry director and leader, Odell. She's a wonderful. If you know her, you love her. She's great. She's really helped our prayer ministry so much since last year. Um, but I remember she pulled out uh, kind of a list of guidelines and rules. And there was a little bit of a, a kickback because on one of the rules it said don't pray in tongues over people. Like when you're praying for people up front, don't pray in tongues over them. And now what I really appreciate that rule because at one point we had somebody super sweet, but that's all they did. People would come up and they just, you just hear them, she bought a hundred right, all over somebody. And it's just like, oh, okay, uh, just praying, just praying, screaming at them in tongues. And they were like, this is weird. What's happening? <laughs> Right? And why is it weird? Because they can't get in on what you're praying. It doesn't mean that the speaking in tongues is bad. It just means they don't know what you're doing, especially if they're not from a charismatic background. They've never been around it before. They're going to do what Paul says they're going to do. They're going to think you're crazy and leave. <laughs> There's a reason he's, it's in there, y'all. It's, it's in there. Go read it. He said, don't do that. They're going to think you're crazy and they're going to leave. I love it. So many people are like, well, they're just not ready for that kind of move of God. No, they think you're weird. <laughs> like, it's that easy. <laughs> Don't over-spiritualize it. It's simple. Stop being stupid and being weird. Like, just follow the real leading of the Holy Spirit, right, and follow what he has set out for us. So she put it in the list, and it was funny because there's so many people who are like, oh, they're not going to let us pray in tongues. I was like, it's, no, that's, no, that's not what that means. It means when somebody comes up for prayer, you don't know them. And, and there might be moments, right, we had the last Sunday, and we'll even do it today, if, if you're saying, I really want to go after my prayer language, then yes, the person praying for you is going to begin to pray in tongues. Totally. We're totally cool with that. But in the most cases, in most situations, we want them to understand what we're praying. Why? So they can get in on the amen. <laughs> they can get in on the hallelujah. Why? Because they can understand what you're saying. It edifies. He even talks about it. If we don't play the notes clearly on the instruments, how can you answer the call to worship? Or how can you answer the call to battle? This is important. See, when we operate in gifts more and more, we become better at it. I love how people treat this so differently. It's so funny to me. Like, I've, I've heard people, I've had conversations with many people at this point about the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm very passionate about this topic, if you couldn't tell. I, I, I grew up in, in an environment where I witnessed a lot of abuse, right? And so on the other side of it, though, I've met a lot of people that have been completely cut off from this power of the Spirit, right? So you cannot tell me there isn't a perfect place in the center, because there is, <laughs> There's a perfect place where you can experience the power of God and also not be, like, freaky weird. <laughs> it, it, it exists, I promise, right? And so, like, I, I've seen so many abuses with this and stuff, but, but it's funny because so many people tell me, well, if God wanted me to speak in tongues, he'd make me speak in tongues. Really? He'd just make you do it, huh? Because every other spiritual gift works like that too, huh? He'd just make you do it! <laughs> just possess you and you... Do, do we not forget that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control? <laughs> They just, that's why I was like, people like, oh, I couldn't help it, Pastor. I had to release this word. No, you could help it. There's scripture that says the prophet controls his own spirit. <laughs> so don't lie to me. <laughs> you could help it, right? You didn't want to. That's, that's the difference, right? So we're talking about this Holy Spirit, but yet he, he, gives, us, he gives us this gift. And, and understand, that it, just like anything, the more we do it, the more we grow in it. If somebody in here, you said, I have the gift, Pastor. The Holy Spirit has given me the gift of giving. Well, first of all, praise God. We are glad you are here. Thank the Lord. So when the offering plate comes by, right, or you walk by that box out there, it, you know what's crazy to me is you might say you have the gift of giving, but what I know doesn't happen is the money doesn't just climb out of your wallet and into the box. Wouldn't that be wild, though? You'd be like, what kind of church is this, right? Like, what's happening? I'm not like the kids' ministry. They use a vacuum, and they just, like, suck it all. I always think, so. like, we do that on Sunday morning, right? People would love it. And so anyway, you say, I've got the gift of giving. What does it take? No, you actually have to partake and, and give. It's just like with any spiritual gift. It, prophecy. You begin to learn how to prophesy. What does the Scripture teach about it? Right? What, this is, we have a whole course on it you can take, and it's awesome. Teach you how to prophesy, how to be used by the Spirit in that way. We learn. It's just like with anything. So this is a gift. When talking specifically about tongues, if you say, I want a prayer language, this is something, if you want it, you can have it. But it requires active participation. 
That's what I'll take. Now, you say, if I don't, am I, am I less than? No, of course not. But can I tell you something? i just be honest with you. I love praying in tongues. You might say, wow, that's weird. I've never come back. Cool, whatever. I, I don't care. I'm just telling you, it's amazing, <laughs> right, to be edified for use of the kingdom. You know, when I get frustrated and angry and mad because I felt like I've been done wrong, you know what I do is I like to get in my prayer closet and I like to pray in the spirit. And I come out praying for that person. Why? Because I need to get his heart. And the quickest way to that is to pray, let the spirit of God pray through me. <laughs> Bypass all my mess. <laughs> And get me there. Okay, so I'm just telling you, it edifies, it brings joy, it brings peace, and it's a humbling gift. There's many times Paul says, I don't even know how to pray, so I let the Spirit pray through me. I don't even know how to pray. You guys, we're talking about Paul. He wrote the majority of the New Testament, and he says, there's times where I don't even know how to pray. So it's okay. Cut yourself some slack. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Holy Spirit, what should I pray for? How should I pray? Some of us, I believe, struggle with this gift because uh, we don't like our mind being unfruitful. I found often men don't usually struggle to as bad because uh, men, we have this amazing gift. We can think about nothing. It's beautiful. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, just, oh, yes, praise God. And you know what drives a woman just crazy is a man who's thinking about nothing. They just can't accept it because, like, they can't do it, right? They're like, you know, you have to be thinking about something, right? <laughs> and so, but here's the thing is it, 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 it's, it's unfruitful in your mind why your spirit is praying. And we, some of us may struggle with that. That's okay move this along here. Oh, the last thing I kind of want to address before we wind this down. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 through 22. I grew up hearing this, so I want it to be very clear. Just in case, like me, you grew up hearing this verse used in this way, so you know the correct context for it and how to apply it uh, in your life. But 1 Corinthians 14, 21, 22, uh, Paul says this, it is written in the scriptures, I will speak to my own people through the strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So you see, the speaking in tongues is a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Okay, so people will take that verse, and I've heard it preached many times, they'll take that verse, and what they'll do is they'll say, see, we should speak in tongues in front of everybody. No, that's <laughs> not what that means. Let me, let me show you. He, so remember, uh, well, many of you guys know this. I say it all the time, but Scripture is a whole story. We include all of it, right? We, we don't just throw part of it in way and say, well, here we are now, right? It, it's a whole story and it all ties together. So 1 Corinthians 14, 21, this verse is a loose quotation, a summation of Isaiah 28, 9 through 12. The context of Isaiah 28 is helpful for this situation. The situation in Isaiah 28 is that prophets have tried to get the Israelite with words they can understand in Hebrew. However, the Israelites would not listen to the prophet's warning, so Isaiah prophesied that soon they would hear the strange tongues of the Assyrian invaders who the Israelites would not be able to understand. So in this context, context strange language languages, I can't speak, were not a sign that would help the Israelites understand and repent. Rather, they were negative signs of God's attitude toward the Israelites who would, who would know that God's judgment was on them when they heard the unknown tongues of the Assyrian army. So in short, tongues, or the languages of Isaiah 28, are a negative sign of God's attitude or judgment toward the Israelites and the exclusion from his blessings. Now, why is Paul using this in application? Because what he's stressing home to him is all, if all you guys do is speak in tongues every time you get together, you are not preaching the gospel. What does that mean? People are being excluded and being placed under judgment because they cannot hear or receive the gospel. This is a problem. <laughs> when we come together, you should hear the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that without him you're a lost, dead sinner, and you need his forgiveness. You need to repent of your sins and be restored in right relationship with God, that he paid the price on the cross for your sins. And by simply surrendering to him and declaring him as Lord, asking him to forgive you of your sins and repenting, he will meet you right there. The gospel. Now, if all I did was speak in tongues, you would have no idea about any of that. And what would I be doing? I'd be subjecting you to judgment. Not even giving you the opportunity to repent. Why? Because you never heard the good news. This is serious. Like, this is important. This is why I'm passionate about the word of God. This is why I'm passionate about the gospel. Why, yes, I want to see the spirit move freely. I love, man, when people come in and they get excited about the Lord. I love passionate worship services. I love when you see people moving in the gifts of the spirit. I love people coming up. I mean, you heard, you heard Luke, you heard Brian, you heard so many different people giving prophetic words today in service. I love all of that. But at the end of the day, we need to be revealing Jesus. Because this is what the Holy Spirit does. Prayer team, why don't you come on up. Here's what we're going to do. I want to give time to respond wherever you can find room to come on up. <laughs> I'm like, come on up. You're like, where? 
anywhere there's room. Obviously, the first, first row, you guys are just getting prayer. That's just, you have no option. You're just, you're, just kidding. you're just right here. It's like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Let me see. I want to read this last portion of Scripture to you. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. 1 Corinthians 14, 36 through 40 goes on to say, Or do you think God's word originated with you, Corinthians? Are you the only ones to whom it was given? If you claim to be a prophet or think you are spiritual, you should recognize that what I am saying is a command from the Lord himself. But if you do not recognize this, you yourself will not be recognized. That sounds serious. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. Right? You may have been here for a minute. You may have noticed that, hey, some people worship during worship. They like to speak in tongues. You're close to them so you can hear them. Otherwise, you probably don't. You know why? Because we have this place jamming. <laughs> so you can all worship in your own way as long as it's not a shofar and you're, you're blowing a horn in here. I'll just, that's it. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. So, <laughs> but we understand this, right? It doesn't mean uh, Scott and Eric is actually here next Sunday. Occasionally, Scott, you know, he'll be prophesying or something and he'll, he'll throw out a tongue or two, right? And you'll be like, what did he just say, right? And you'll be like, uh, it's not like we get up and go, you broke the rules! You! Right? No, 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 no. Well, we don't forbid speaking in tongues, but what you won't experience at this church is any one of our leadership getting up here and going, all right, I want everybody to get up right now and speak in tongues. Do you know why? Because I immediately isolated a lot of people in the room and made them feel less than. And because, again, Paul himself said, do not do that. <laughs> so we take that seriously, right? But at the same time, we don't, we don't want to stop speaking in tongues. If you're in here and you're worshiping the Lord in the spirit, right, and you're not distracting those around you, but you're just going after Jesus, that's great. Right? It's, it's, it's for personal edification. And in that moment, you're having a personal moment with Jesus. And that's wonderful. I'm not telling you right now you can only pray in tongues at your closet at home. Right? <laughs> I'm saying be mindful of those around you. Right? Because as we gather corporately to worship, it's important. So everything done in proper order. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray over you. And then if you got to go... You're dismissed. You get out of here. Go get your kids. Get out of here. We love you. God bless you. We hope to catch you. The men's event, guys, this, this coming Saturday at 6. Be here. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be out here having a good time. Um, and then next Sunday, of course, Scott and Ari's going to be here. It's going to be a great time. But if you say, you know what, Pastor, I want to go deeper. We're going to have some worship. You say, I want to linger a little bit. I want to spend some time with the Lord. I want to, I want to, I want to spend some time with the Holy Spirit. We're going to hang out for a little bit. If you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm actually really drawn. I really want to discover my prayer language. I want to have somebody pray with me about that. Prayer team is up here and available. They want to pray with you. So I say all that to say, this isn't a spectator sport. <laughs> so you're like, well, I just want to hang around and watch. No, go ahead and go. <laughs> but if you say, I want to go after Jesus, then stay. Let's worship for a little bit. Other than that, they'll understand. If you got somewhere to go, by you walking out doesn't mean I'm like, oh, they're just not ready. No, that's <laughs> like you might have somewhere to be, and I understand. It's almost 1 o'clock. Like, I get it. Right? Don't worry, the Baptists have already beaten us to the buffet. They have eaten and they are gone. <laughs> the line will be short, okay? <laughs> but I just want to pray over you. And if you say, I want to linger, I want to get prayer, we want to make that available to you. Because this series really is it's about encountering the presence of God. Not just about hearing about it, but encountering. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for every person in this room. Holy Spirit, have your way. Lord, I pray for the skeptics in the room that are like, I just don't know. Lord, I pray you would encounter them. Lord, that you would encounter them in a powerful way, that you would show yourself strong to them. Lord, I pray for the one steeped in depression right now, that you would break through with your magnificent light. God, with that joy of the Holy Spirit, that peace of the Holy Spirit, God, that we would break that in Jesus' name. I pray for every person that's feeling drawn right now to go deeper, that, Lord, they wouldn't ignore that call, but they would press in. God, we need more of you more of you in our lives, less of us. So we give you this time. Lord, I bless this congregation as they go. I pray that everywhere they go, they recognize the divine setups all around them, and they wouldn't miss it, but they would partner with you and what you're doing and your timing, and we thank you for it. And in Jesus' mighty and matchless name, everybody said, all right, give God some praise. And if you'd like to worship, stay hanging out. If not, God bless you. You are released. Go. Go.